right, so uh, we start with an, an Australian Aboriginal researcher's reflection on research during the disability rights movement. Most welcome, John Gilroy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as has as, as been mentioned, my name is Dr. John Gilroy. I'm from the Centre for Disability Research and Policy at Sydney University. I want to thank you, Anna, and I also want to thank the Nordic Welfare Council and the NNDR for inviting me to speak to, to all of you today. It is, uh, it is always a pleasure to uh, further partnerships with, uh, with Indigenous communities from all around the world, and in, in, in particular working with the Sami and Swedish peoples here who are involved in, in the Indigenous human rights movement and, of course, our work at the, at the UN. In my family, it is respectful to talk about where we grew up, and in particular our family. So you can see a photo here. This is of my favourite campsites. Uh, I'm a Koori from the Ewan Nation. Uh, my Aboriginality comes from my mother's side. Uh, my dad, um, he was born in the UK. So my brothers and I nicknamed him our cranky Scotsman. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the above photo shows um, basically that it's one of my, our favourite fishing holes where we catch snapper and tailor and all of that because our land is very important to us. It's where our ancestors um, are born and it's where culture actually evolves and, and makes us uh, curry. I've been involved in the disability rights movement my whole life. When I was a kid, I had a profound speech impairment. You wouldn't think so now because I'm talking all, all good and very fast. Uh, but importantly, I, I, um, I've started working um, as a support worker and then I ended up going into advocacy and now I'm in research and advocacy at the University of Sydney. In contrast to the Nordic region, we have very good statistics. We have a really good statistics on Indigenous peoples, but also on peoples with disability. Uh, we have numerous uh, periodic census surveys, which are done every five years, and we also have what's called, uh, what, what we call snapshots. So it's when the Australian government works with particular interest groups to collect data, and we call that a snapshot. So it's not as broad as a census. These data are used to inform policy and community controlled organisations. So we have organisations that we Aboriginal people control in disability, in ageing, in health, a range of diverse areas. But we also have organisations that are managed and run by people with disability. We call them, we call them people with disability controlled organisations. Our data shows that we Aboriginal people represent around 3% of the Australian population, numbering over half a million people. This figure shows that the, um, this figure on the screen here, shows that um, in, our, in, our, in, the, in the Aboriginal population, that nearly 8% of the population have a disability. Um, so comparatively, the rate of disability in the Aboriginal population is, between, is, is a little more than twice the rate of disability in the non-Aboriginal population. And that's quite significant. This table shows that the prevalence of disability is double for the younger population. Um, however, it is around the same for people above the age of 55 years. But for the ages between 35 years and, 50, and 54 years, it is around three times the rate. So the rate of disability in Aboriginal population is around three times the rate of the non-Aboriginal population. And many of the disabilities that, um, that, 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 that exist within Aboriginal population are, 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 could be prevented. So we're talking about psychiatric disability, physical disability and sensory. So by sensory I'm talking about hearing impairments and, and vision impairments. Some of the causes of disability include domestic violence, high rates of chronic health, so I'm talking about diabetes, renal disease, um, Traumatic brain injury, so traumatic brain injury is caused by car accidents, petrol sniffing and alcohol misuse and chroming. So chroming is when you get a spray can to an upside down and smell it. And drugs and alcohol misuse. And I want to say that some of these problems in our communities are symptoms of poverty and disadvantage. Because our data show, is, is that good that we can actually measure the, um, how Aboriginal people are performing in the social determinants of health. So I'm not going to go into great detail because I don't have time. This is a figure that I use in my research that I, that I adapted. 
And what this figure shows is how the social determinants of health is intergenerational. How it starts in the early childhood, goes through education, into adulthood, into, into um, having children, and how those children live in poverty and disadvantage. Now, I want to make this point. Our data shows that Indigenous peoples with disabilities are amongst the most disadvantaged, unhealthiest, and oppressed group in the Aboriginal population when compared to those Aboriginal peoples who do not have a disability. Even the United Nations has reported that we Aboriginal people, including my own mob, experience disadvantage equivalent to, to developing countries. So if the UN's going to report that, and the UN has reported on that for over 10 years, then something's going on. Because Australia is a very wealthy country with an economy of over $1 trillion. So we have a very large uh, uh, country, large, large continent geographically, very wealthy country, but yet we colonised peoples are the most oppressed and disadvantaged uh, cultural group in Australia. Now, statistically, we would like to compare our, our, ourselves to, to Sami. However, we cannot do that as there's limited statistical data on Sami with a disability. Now, I worked with a friend of mine, uh, Professor Sco Schofield, on doing a report on the social determinants, uh, not a report, a book chapter on the social determinants of health in, 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 in her book. And we wanted to compare ourselves to Indigenous peoples around the world. But sadly, we couldn't do that. Um, we couldn't compare ourselves to Sami because there's no data. Now, I do understand why the Nordic region does not want to collect um, these, these data. I want to make this point that we Aboriginal peoples have experienced similar events to, to Sami. In particular, we experienced attempted genocide. So when the British invaded our nations, the British wanted to destroy us and wipe us out. In the early 1900s, they had a saying called soothing the dying pillow. That means to kill and destroy Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal people. But throughout the, throughout the 1900s, when, 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 when we achieved liberation and engaged fully in democracy, we worked with the governments to actually uh, collect this data. So, for example, we have an Aboriginal disability agency called First People's Disability Network, and we also have um, a statistics unit in Sydney University called the City Centre for Aboriginal Torture on the Statistics. And they work with our government to collect that data. So they work from the planning phase through the collection and how that data is used. And that, that helps, that ensures that we have control over that process. And that's the important thing. If you're involved from the start, that data um, should not be used um, a, against you. And that data has helped us to actually create our own organisations managed by us in Aboriginal way. <coughs> So we Aboriginal people have asked ourselves, with all these statistics, why are we still amongst the most disadvantaged population in Australia? So for me, I took to explore research. Not just reading research, but the process of research. I wanted to know what is being said about us that's going into, into policy. Because after all, the Australian government walks around and our Prime Minister looking all handsome with his suit saying, we have evidence-based policy but yet our experiences are contrary to what those policies are coming out. And what I have found in my journey is rather astonishing. So I was involved with the Centre for Disability Research and Policy uh, in undertaking one of the biggest audits of scientific disability literature in Australia on Australian peoples with disabilities, including Aboriginal people. And I managed the Aboriginal components of that particular study. And what we concluded from that was that the size of the body of, re of research is disproportionately small compared to the multiple events and strategies in Australian policy to redress the level of disadvantage of Aboriginal people with disability. So if you have a look here, we found over 1,000 scientific articles, but yet only a couple of hundreds written about us. If you have a look at the grey literature, there's even less. And this is rather astonishing because I was sitting there with this little pile of research papers thinking, I've been involved in, in the disability rights movement for over 20 years. And I have seen researchers come in and go, come in and go. So we have a nickname for them. We call them pelicans and seagulls. They come in, ha! Ah! eat up all the food, or in this case, eat up all the money, and then poof. It's like a wizard. They disappear. So these reports are not being published. 
The researchers come in, do their job, get a healthy paycheck, but yet we are sitting there, not benefiting from these research. You ask any Indigenous person, the last thing taken from a colonised, oppressed person is their knowledge. And it happens over and over again. That is ongoing colonialism. That is colonisation of our minds and ongoing colonialism of our people. Secondly, many Indigenous peoples are talking about disability in very different ways to non-Indigenous peoples. This discussion is rather new. So Aboriginal people talk about impairments, but they don't talk about disability as in the collective noun that's used in English. Rather, these communities see other issues more important than disability, such as high rates of suicide, such as the issues pertaining to the social determinants of health and inequality that I've just mentioned earlier. So disability is, is not seen as a high priority. Now, similarly, we would like to, to compare our experiences to that of Sami. We would like to read research on Sami with, with a disability to see if our experience is similar. But there's not much written by Sami with Sami who have a disability. <coughs> so what does this research really mean for us then if we are still amongst the most oppressed um, population in Australia? So we have Aboriginal research, the Aboriginal rights movement, we have the disability rights movement, but in the Aboriginal rights movement, disability is not being spoken about. In the disability rights movement, we Aboriginal peoples are not being spoken about. Even in 1981, when we had the International Year of Persons with Disability, I searched hundreds of papers. Not one of them mentioned Aboriginal people. One of the most biggest events of the world for the disability rights movement were ignored. So effectively, this is what it looks like for us in terms of being an Aboriginal person with disability. So this is... This, this, this is the disability side, so, uh, so the Aboriginal side, so I'm going to a disability org, but the Aboriginal side's blind. But if I'm going to an Aboriginal organisation, they are blind to, to the needs of me of having a disability. So although we Aboriginal people with disabilities embody Aboriginality or indigeneity and disability as one identity, when we access specific controlled organisations, we are not seen as a whole person. But if we access generic community services, like schools or hospitals, most of the time we're not seen at all. We're just given a number or we're seen as a person. So we kind of pushed and pulled in different ways and expected to act in different ways and these researchers are treating us just the same. So just recently, we, we Aboriginal researchers are deconstructing these research that's written about us without us and, and pulling it apart. What we have found is that, is that we, we Aboriginal peoples are experiencing what's called academic neo-imperialism. And what this is, this is when researchers pick up theories, hypotheses, beliefs and ideals from the global north or Western academia, and applying it to us Indigenous peoples as normative. So they're applying their own views, they have their own, their, their own mindsets of what is important in terms of research. It is that bad in Australia that we have had graves of our ancestors exhumed for research. So there was a condition that the colonialists uh, and the government have seen as a disability. It was a bend of the, of the tibia, nicknamed boomerang leg, because we have boomerangs in Australia. And it was seen as disability. But for the Aboriginal peoples, it wasn't seen as a disability. I have a photo of a person with boomerang leg carrying a, can a dead kangaroo. Have you ever seen the size of those kangaroos? They're really heavy. Yes, walking by, hello. But yet the researchers looked and go, oh, he's got a disability. So they actively went out and exhumed bodies dead bodies of their ancestors. That's like me going to your grandmother's grave and digging her up. Secondly, we've had the testing of nuclear weapons in Australia. Australia and Britain, in the, in the heart of Australia, tested nuclear warheads. I'm talking, um, um, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, 9,000 megatons. So that's a big nuclear bomb that they've tested there. And they knew that there were Aboriginal people living around that area. So radiation clouds went over those communities, caused cause horrendous amounts of disabilities. Even the bodies 
of children were exhumed for study for that test. So Aboriginal people were not only seen as, as a lower class, but they were actually treated as though they're flora and fauna, resulting in disabilities. So these researchers were going in with their own views, with their own mindsets. Even applying and testing disability assessments and screening tools on Aboriginal people and coming up with, with horrendous conclusions from those specific tools. So right now, we um, are exploring the use of decolonising methodologies in Aboriginal disability research. And I have been publishing quite a lot on this. So decolonisation, very broadly, is a process of critically deconstructing the current research systems that is born from colonisation and colonialism and reconstructing it using Indigenous standpoint and methodologies within an emancipatory framework that favours us Indigenous peoples. So we look at the process of research and we turn it around and we shine it on the coloniser. And what that means is that not only do we have to read the literature and the process of, 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 of epistemologies, but we deconstruct it to see what, to see what the behaviours were at the time and how that has impacted on us as Aboriginal peoples. So at the moment, I'm looking at a few of these. So I'm looking at Indigenous standpoint theory, and I've published uh, that. Um, I've also tested a couple of specific methodologies um, that was born from Maori peoples and that has came from other Indigenous peoples around Australia. And what I'm finding is that, um, that we really need to come up as Indigenous peoples with our own standpoint. That means our positionality before we can come up with our own specific methodologies for disability research. So I want to, to summarise my, uh, my presentation today. Our position as Indigenous people with disabilities is historically, socially and historic and in institutionally shaped within the values and, 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 and principles of colonialism and ableism. We need to learn from each other, Sami, Swedish, Aboriginal peoples, we need to learn from each other about our experiences of being a person with disability, being Indigenous, and, being, and, 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 and the specific research and policies that impact on us. <clears throat> I, want, I want to give this advice to Sami. Statistics is important, but it's part of the solution. We need to give Indigenous people a voice. So the limited qualitative research done with us has actually silenced us. <clears throat> We need to refocus disability policy philosophies and principles. So I'm talking about the cultural and uh, so the, the diversity of cultures and environments within, within Sami communities and also within Aboriginal communities. <clears throat> we need to refocus that. And we need to refocus that with the, by using Indigenous research methodologies born from us, about us, within our cultures, within our spirituality and within our lands. Now, I do not know where to start. But I do know that coming here, working with all of you at this symposia is part, is, 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 is part of the solution, is actually a way of starting this discussion, this partnership between Aboriginal Australia and the Nordic region. Thank you very much. <clears throat>